on tonight's episode of Mr. Norris's In Case You Missed It. We look at the Boston Tea Party, some of the events that led up to the party, what happened during it, and what were some of the consequences for the colonists. Hey, hi, hello, and what is up, everybody? It's your host, Mr. Norris, the history teacher with the good hair. And tonight we're going to be talking about the Boston Tea Party, events that led up to the Boston Tea Party, and some of the ramifications of the famed Boston Tea Party. Some very exciting stuff on the docket for you guys tonight. Uh, This all takes place in our chapter leading up to the American Revolution uh, and a series of events leading up to the American Revolution where we left off in one of my last videos. We talked about British taxation of the colonies following the French and Indian War, how they were trying to pay off massive war debt that they accumulated after the French and Indian War. And they were doing so by taxing the colonies um, through various different acts, such as the Stamp Act, the Townshend Acts, so on and so forth. Different acts that Parliament was passing that the colonies uh, and protest groups inside the colonies, such as the Sons of Liberty, argued were unfair due to the uh, statement of no taxation without representation, that people in the colonies weren't weren't being represented. So we've kind of covered that. Well, we're going to pick the story back up in the year 1773. And a new act gets passed by the British Parliament on the colonies called the Tea Act of 1773. Now, on the surface, the Tea Act sounds wonderful. And let me describe it for you. There was a company or an agency inside of Great Britain called the East India Company. Uh, And basically, they were traders that sent different products around the world. They were kind of think of like Amazon before Amazon. They were a massive company that made, you know, large sums of money. Uh, and had a lot of power inside of uh, Great Britain actually making like government policies in Great Britain. Anyways, the East India Company, in an effort to get rid of some of their uh, surplus of tea and their supply of tea and to make, obviously, lots of money, they helped push through the Tea Act of 1773 through British Parliament. And here's kind of what it said. It actually made British tea very cheap in the colonies, which on the surface sounds fantastic. You would think that colonists would love this. Oh, really cheap British tea. Why, thank you. Here's why they didn't like this. A big problem for the British Crown and the East India Company and not making their money back was that people in the colonies were just smuggling things in. Uh, An example of of, a famed smuggler was John Hancock. People like him were literally getting products from other places in the world and smuggling them into the colonies to avoid paying taxes on these products that would just go to the British British Crown, right? So smuggling was a huge problem. And a way to try to get around smuggling, the British government tried to make their tea so super cheap that people wouldn't want to go through the cost and the trouble of smuggling and just pay for their tea. And like I said on the surface, that sounds wonderful. Very cheap tea. But the colonists saw right through the plan. They said, wait, 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 wait a second. You're not just making this tea very cheap for us out of the kindness of your heart. You're trying to make this tea so cheap that we're just going to pay for it and buy it up And you'll get your greedy little tax money without representing us still. Uh Uh-uh. No dice. And they begin to protest this tea act and boycott British tea. Now, ships sail over to the colonies from Great Britain uh, containing uh, British tea to be distributed and sold throughout the colonies. And in several colonies, this tea gets turned around and sent back to Great Britain, such as New York, uh, Philadelphia, um, uh, obviously Pennsylvania. And then Charleston, South Carolina also sends back a uh, shipment of British tea. However, Boston is the exception. A ship rolls into Boston Harbor called the Dartmouth. And once it is there, again, the people in, in, in Massachusetts and Boston react just like people all around the colonies did. We're not unloading this tea. We don't want it. We're not going to use it. You can have it back. Well, that wasn't a good enough answer for the royal governor at the time. He said, no, either you're unloading all of this tea or you're going to pay all the taxes on it and then we'll send it back to Great Britain. I don't know what the big deal was. I'm more of an iced coffee guy myself, right? But uh, apparently these people, you know, really like their tea. And if I'm going tea, by the way, we're all on the topic, I'm going iced tea and I'm going Turkey Hill iced tea. Everybody knows that's fantastic, right? All this nonsense over tea. Well, whatever. The time period, I guess people, they had nothing better to do than sip some tea, whatever. But the colonists say, we're not going to unload that tea. We're also not going to pay the taxes on it. Get out of here, right? And we know that Boston is the hotbed of all this protest activity. This is where the Sons of Liberty operate, their mainstay of operations. So we know they're definitely not going to follow these directions. Well, now they start discussing and talking about, well, then what should we do? 
if we're not going to take this tea off the ship and sell it, and if we're definitely not going to pay the taxes, what do we do? And they start meeting in locations, taverns around Boston, uh, like the Dream, Green Dragon uh, Inn or Green Dragon Tavern and the Old South Meeting House. They start meeting the Sons of Liberty. People leading these meetings are Sam Adams, Paul Revere, and it starts to get discussed, what do we do? Well, at some point, one of these meetings, and it's rumored to have been Sam Adams, somebody says, how about we take the tea and dump it inside of Boston Harbor? And one thing leads to another, and this is what the Sons of Liberty decide to do as the ultimate act of protest. No, we're not going to drink your tea. No, we're not going to pay for it. No, we're not going to pay our taxes. We're going to dump it all in Boston Harbor, get rid of it. And that's literally what they decide to do. They storm out of this old meeting house on December 16th, 1773. They head down to the ship to Dartmouth in Boston Harbor, uh, and they disguise themselves as members of the band of KISS in order to evade being detected. <laughs> I'm just kidding. They didn't actually dress up like members of KISS. That would be awesome, though, by the way. Like, rocking. Yeah. Uh, no, they disguise themselves as Mohawk Indians to hide their identities. Um, and the Sons of Liberty storm this ship. They throw 342 chest of tea into Boston Harbor. They take their tomahawks, crack them open, dump out all the contents, about 90,000 pounds of tea. They literally turn Boston Harbor into a big teapot. Yeah, I know. Ridiculous. Uh, what is the dollar damage, you ask? And I assume that you're asking, maybe wrongfully, but uh, I assume you're asking that. In today's standards, they destroy about $2 million worth of tea. So a very hefty price. Now, what is King George's reaction to this? And what is the British government's reaction to this? Uh, not happy, to say the least. No, they are extremely angered. Nothing has angered them to the point that they are now. Not Stamp Act protests, not Townshend Act protests. They look at it as a spit in the face, right? We made this tea super cheap for you guys. We're doing you a favor. And you take this tea and destroy it. You're going to pay for this, Boston. You're going to pay for this, Massachusetts. How does the British Crown react? Well, they pass a series of acts called the Coercive Acts uh, on the colony of Massachusetts. And they are so brutal in punishing the colony that colonists actually start to refer to these as the intolerable acts. Here's what they did. First of all, they closed the port of Boston and they said that nothing comes in or out. No money is going to be made in Boston until you pay us back for the damage that you caused you know, due to dumping all that tea into the harbor, that two million bucks that you owe us. No small fee there. Um, next thing they said, the government of Boston is now under complete British control. So yeah, you still have your royal governor, but any, you know, elected or duly elected assembly bodies that you had in Boston or Massachusetts, eh -eh, no more. You answer to us and you answer to people that we appoint, you know, so pretty rough there. Uh, next thing, any British citizen or any member of the British hierarchy or people that are running Boston that get accused of a crime, they are now going to have their trials not in the colonies, in Great Britain. And this angers a lot of people in Boston because, um, you know, what a, what a disrespectful thing to do. That basically gives people who are loyal to the crown free reign to do whatever they want in the colonies with no consequences because if they have their trial in Great Britain, they're probably going to be found not guilty. It's moments like this that turned people like John Adams onto the Patriot cause, right? He was the lawyer for the British soldiers during the Boston Massacre. He gave them the most fair trial you possibly could. And after stuff like this, he's like, wait a second, what is going on here, right? I gave them a fair trial. Now they have their trials in Great Britain. Shenanigans, I call shenanigans, right? Last thing that the Intolerable Acts do is they say, more soldiers are gonna be sent to Massachusetts because you can't control yourself. And while they're there, we're reinstating the Quartering Act and we're really gonna forcefully uh, make sure that it's that it's enforced now, right? You have to provide a uh, quarter for these soldiers that are being brought over there. All right. Well, now we have to look at how do the colonies react to the intolerable acts. Massachusetts, it's obviously enraged by this, and groups like the Sons of Liberty are going to continue doing their thing and boycotting uh, British goods. But a lot of the other colonies are now starting to join in. They didn't really agree with Massachusetts and Boston and the Boston Tea Party. They're like, yeah, that's going a little bit over the top. But then they thought the Intolerable Acts was also way over the top as far as punishments. And you start seeing colonies like Virginia and Pennsylvania and slowly but surely come to their aid. They start sending supplies to Massachusetts and they start having assemblies where people are speaking out saying this is totally wrong. They also begin things called committees of correspondence where now the colonies are going to be communicating and sharing information. 
and sharing news between each other. This is a, a, a wonderful step. Uh, and then this also leads to the first meeting uh, of the first Continental Congress in Philadelphia, where 56 delegates from 12 different colonies come together and meet and try to figure out what exactly to do, right? The, our founding fathers decided, let's get all of our best and brightest minds into one room and let's start figuring out, you know, where do we go from here? Because we're talking about a series of really nasty events between Crown and colonists, and we got to try to, to fix this thing. It's at this point that for the first time in the colonies, you're seeing them not just fighting for their rights as Englishmen. They're fighting for their rights for the first time as something totally different. The colonies are starting to form together into some kind of new shape. And it's at this time you start hearing chants and slogans such as join or die, right? Separately, we are weak and can be taken advantage of. But together, we can form something very lethal, something like a snake, a snake. Yeah, okay, that was embarrassing. Um, what do they agree to do at the First Continental Congress in 1774? They say, hey, let's continue boycotting British goods. We're not going to buy them as much as we possibly can. We're going to write a letter to the king asking him to take back the coercive acts or the intolerable acts. Please undo this very fair measure that you've levied against the colonies. Uh, they also decide, hey, in our own individual colonies, we should probably start forming militias just in case, foreshadowing, down the road in the very near future, things start to get a little bit hostile, a little bit violent. Let's start putting together militias. And last but not least, they say in one year from now, 1775, we will come back together. We will form the Second Continental Congress. We'll take a temperature check exactly where we are in the colonies and what we need to do going forward. Okay. So there you have it. That's the story of the Boston Tea Party, one of the most iconic moments of the early revolution where uh, colonists in Massachusetts literally in the ultimate act of protest, dump tea into the harbor, destroy British property and say, we're not gonna take it. Um, so it's, a, it's an awesome part of our history, an awesome event leading up to the revolution. And what comes after it, like I said, is the beginning of the colonies forming something different. We're not just Englishmen anymore, we're something totally different and unique, and we're gonna start fighting for it. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you do, please like, comment, or subscribe. Any of that would be just fine. Remember that history is life, and in the words of George Washington, the surest basis for public happiness is knowledge. So go out there and get some. Have a good night, everybody.